All right, and we're back. This is the BSI Comics. What did you call it? A vodcast? Vodcast. Vlog. Vlog. Horrible name. Just think that somebody would streamline it at some point. I think vodcast is the vodcast most appropriate. All right, since Ted likes it, I'll go with it. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have Mr. Ted Wally, a special guest. Yes. Uh, local comics creator, uh, kind of a, well, I, I don't know if legend, but very well known in the community. We all love you. You're, you're an educator over at Delgado. You're a... Uh, Actually, Educator of the Year so, uh, several times, and you do a uh, comic called Matilda versus the Forces of the Third Grade. Yeah, yeah. Forces of Evil versus the Third Grade. It's uh, about a uh, the daughter, the firstborn child of uh, Lucifer, who has a epiphany, sells her soul to God to get out of hell, but God gives her three tasks that she has to complete while on Earth in the form of an eight-year-old girl. She has to learn about the beauty the treasure of the human condition. She has to stop her father from destroying all of mankind. And she also has to pass the third grade. And she has a demon bear. Yes, she has a little demon bear. It's kind of like this Calvin and Hobbes uh, dynamic, uh, except uh, Hobbes is trying to kill Calvin all the time in this instance. Which is a way better version of Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. I, I feel like, as much as we all love Calvin and Hobbes, if there was a little more bloodshed and a beat-up kid, yeah, exactly. There's uh, there's a lot more violence and bloodshed in, the, in their little scuffles, and there's not so much wisdom exchanged. So the humor comes from the, the violence of it, because as we know in comedy, everything's funnier when it's happening to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like this. <laughs> See, it was funny because it happened to him. Like, yes, it'd be less funny if it was happening to me. Exactly. Which proves your point. See? Uh, right now, we actually have copies of Matilda versus the Forces of the Third Grade here at BSI Comics. And uh, how many issues? I mean, it. well, let's start over. Originally, you had done it like in single-issue format, and you, you lost them, I think, after Katrina. Was that correct? Yeah, I was. Uh, I had uh, all my artwork and stuff packed up for uh, Dragon Con, and uh, the house that I was staying at on North Pierce... New Orleans, mid city. Uh, it took about four or so feet of water into it, even though it was raised uh, about two feet off the ground. And so I lost all the original artwork for the first three books. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I had to start over again. And, uh, but I got up to four issues, and it was just like when I realized I had lost all the artwork, because there's a lot of people that went through the storm. First couple of years, you know, you go looking for something, and then it's like, oh, yeah, that was something that got lost. So it was when I needed to reprint the first few books because I had ran out of copies. That's when I realized I would lost the original artwork. So uh, you can't scan it in and clean it up, so I just decided to redo it. So uh, you can actually find, as I said, Matilda here over at BSI Comics. We have several copies. You know, definitely come over and check it out. Ted often recommends you buy from the local stores. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I get more if you buy it from me, but you know, I want the shops to feel comfortable carrying the carrying the books. So always buy from the local shops you know, if they have it in stock. And you can also, if you're not from New Orleans area, if you're seeing this on YouTube, you can find it uh, VoodooMaverick.com or Comicsology. Yep. But if you're in New Orleans, definitely come by BSI Comics. We'll be happy to get you a copy. They'll hook you up. Um, so. Uh, Definitely wanted to let people know about Matilda, but we do have a couple of other subjects to talk about. Yeah, what do you want to talk about? Uh, big news, Paul Ryan died. I know, man. That's that's kind of sad. I was, I mean, I remember growing up watching, or rather watching, but reading his work on West Coast Avengers. And it was always, you know, it was okay because I was just kind of caught up in that whole the the whole concept of the West Coast Avengers. But it was when he started working on the Phantom strips that it was like, that was when I really actually noticed that he was a really good artist and a really good storyteller. And so I don't know if it had anything to do with working in that kind of routine of comic book and the monthly uh, comic book scene, but it seemed like he was just more relaxed with the Phantom, and the Phantom stuff is amazing. And that's what I'm going to miss is a lot of his work on the Phantom because... I had a fondness for that character anyway, and just I thought he really made it feel like the pulp. It was it was back. It was really 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 good. It's definitely um, you can tell when someone passes in the industry. It might not be a household name, you know, like a Stanley or a Kirby, mm -hmm. but when you start seeing everyone, Stanley die, he's close. Uh, I don't know. Did he? No, he's close. He's close to a hundred, and uh, but it, 
as everyone knows, when uh, I mean he sold, he died. His soul died a long time. Ago. I think someone else has the rights to his death. Or something. I think so. Oh. Yeah. Does well, it, he does it get published in Chakra? No, but I think he uh, he's already started promoting himself as that he was the creator of his own death. So. Um, so What's your percent? I'm sorry. Uh, you can definitely tell when someone that's so well respected in the industry passes because you see everyone across all of social media start posting about Paul Ryan. And I've even had I asked me, you know, like I see people posting about this. Who is this? It's like, well, you know, Google is your friend. He was definitely uh, a class of of artists that maybe doesn't get the the, the respect that you would expect in that he was a. Pardon the term, a workhorse artist. He was somebody yeah. who was steady, constant, knew his stuff, and you could rely on day in and day out. And you know, like you, you have like your J. Scott Campbells of the world who are amazing, but they're not the guys that are in there in the trenches every day putting out books, putting out a monthly book. Yeah, you know, like it's it, those are the guys that they're the superstars, but the guys that are there that are actually getting you the books on time, people kind of pass over and sort of take for granted. Yeah, he didn't have a he, especially when he was doing a lot of his work at Marvel. He didn't really have that kind of uh, that really glitzy sort of style. You know, everybody latches on to a particular hot artist, and then everybody starts mimicking that artist, and then that artist winds up des- uh, defining you know easily a decade worth of books. And he was never that guy, and that's why I was like really excited when. Uh, colleague showed me the work on the Phantom. And they showed it to me because they're like, I knew I like the Phantom. And I was like, oh man, who's drawing this? And I'm like, oh man, Paul Ryan. And it's like, uh, that name sounds kind of familiar. It's like, oh, I probably remember him from, you know, West Coast Avengers. Uh, he did some, a run on Superman. It's like, oh geez, this totally did not even look like his style. And so it's kind of, it was kind of cool and really refreshing. Uh, it's funny that, you know, Ant-Man came out, what, tail end of last year? Around About that, yeah. November or something like that. And so, obviously, Scott Lang is going to be in uh, Captain America Civil War, which we talked about in the last episode. And so, people talk about Scott Lang, but what I remember Scott Lang from primarily was there was a Fantastic Four run where Mr. Fantastic, because Mr. Fantastic sort of died like four times. It's funny how, like, in comics we talk about the Phoenix. Oh, Jean Grey died so many times. She died technically twice and one fairly recent, once fairly recently. But... People like Mr. Fantastic go missing regularly. He's just an absentee dad. He checks out on his family. You don't hear that about the first family, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, so he was gone for a while, and they had to bring in a new male lead. And so Scott Lang, who I don't think was Ant-Man at the time, I think he, he had kind of retired the position, uh, was, was in the Fantastic Four. And Paul Ryan did like this very long, I think fairly well-remembered run. You know, there was uh, the... The thing where Sue Storm became Malice, right, and all that, and, uh, that's, then, and that's primarily what I remember him from is his Fantastic Four work. Uh, but uh, sad, you know. Uh, yeah, sad news. And so, if uh, anything, I mean, you hear it a lot when uh, artists pass or writers pass, go out and you know, find their work and take a look at their work and stuff like that. And he's definitely he he deserves that in terms of it will you know it should broaden your mind when you see his work. So, yeah, people have asked me when he passed. And it's like, oh, did you know Paul Ryan passed? No, I didn't. But, uh, yeah, I was a fan. I was a fan of his work with the Phantom. So anyone that asks me about who it is, that's who I direct. And it's like, go search for Paul Ryan and the Phantom and um, and introduce, reintroduce your, or introduce yourself to, to a character that's been around for longer than some of the, uh, the printed comic characters and uh, just really well-written stories and well-illustrated. And it's it's a good excuse to actually go through back issue bins, because unfortunately exactly. stuff at a certain point, especially his Marvel stuff, uh, you know, may, who knows, maybe Marvel will be inspired to produce one of those fantastic four okay. trades or West There's Coast plenty of stuff like that that's really good, and just because it's not sought after by everyone or worth a fortune, they don't collect it in the trades. Well, some of it's financial. Some of it's like, why are we put, or like keeping this in stock if we don't know that a certain number of people are going to buy it. Right. On the other hand, there's occasionally things that people come in asking us for pretty regularly that, oh, no, that's not in print for some reason. We don't know. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, sad to hear uh, Mr. Paul Ryan's gone. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about in this episode is, I guess it was last week, 
they had some preview pages of the first issue of Black Panther, which we've been hearing about for, what, two or three months now? Mm-hmm. Uh, Easily. Ta-Nehisi Coates, a, uh, I don't remember what award he won, but uh, an uh, award-winning winning author, uh, is going to be the, the scripter on it. And comics legend Brian Stelfreeze was going to be the artist. And that's all we knew. Um, I was a little skeptical, not not because of Brian Stelfreeze, who's very solid, and as we'll, we'll get to in a, min- uh, in a minute, like the preview pages, but uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates has never written a comic book story. Right. So, uh, and also Black Panther, even though we knew he's going to be in Civil War, uh, people yeah, don't always... Movie. Yeah, it, it's... Yeah, it's... He, his, his books will last usually like a year, maybe two, but then usually sort of go away. So, you know, it, it was, uh, it's one of those books that when they announced it, it's like, oh, like, I, I wonder what they're going to do. Yeah, in the past, uh, characters like him, it's kind of like the whole, it's, it's kind of like what I talked about, like when Iron Man and the first Iron Man movie came out, you know, Iron Man in the public pot eye is like, he was a B-level character. He was a B-lister. In the books and into fans, he was considered, you know, the A-level guy. He was in the Avengers and blah, 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 blah. But nobody knew him outside of the books. And Black Panthers is a similar way in terms of I really think that part of the book being introduced in the way it's being introduced with the talent that's behind it is that they're, I think Marvel is, is going to commit to this and they're not going to let it go like they used to after a year or so because I think it's in about another year or so then he's going to get his own movie out. And, and particularly with everything... And I don't mean this in an insulting way, but everything becoming more PC and culturally aware, I really think Marvel is committing to keeping Black Panther's book out there. And I, I actually think they're going to push it in terms of not as dark as Batman, but they're really going to push his character as, as a staple of the universe and their version, kind of their version of a cross between Batman, Detective Batman. And There's always been Batman. a little bit of Batman, and even though... It's it's obviously a very different concept. There's a little bit of Batman to the Black Panther stuff. It's it's almost a combination of Phantom, yeah, as you mentioned, definitely, and and uh, Batman in the sense of like he's this rich guy who just seeks justice. But there's no, I don't believe there's any like dead parents or anything in the story. No, nah, nah. he's uh, and I've always thought that maybe that's part of the problem with with people trying to get into a Black Panther solo series is as America is obviously the main part of the American comics market. Uh, you know, comics sell in other countries, but if it doesn't work here, they're not putting it out in England. Right. Or, or obviously Africa. And uh, so I feel like as Americans, we don't necessarily know how to get into the concept of this rich African super science prince. Yeah, it, it's a lot, you know, and as, as far as his background goes and stuff like that, so that's why I'm kind of interested to see the approach that they go, because there's Elements of the super scientists, there's elements of the royalty, there's elements of the magical uh, and the tradition of the Black Panther, and it's all magic-oriented and, and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about it, and that kind of leads us into what we're talking about with Brian Selfridge. Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously I want y'all's opinions on, on the, I think it was six pages. Fletch, why don't you? Uh, well, Brian Selfridge, as soon as he's attached to something, I'm immediately drawn into it, because it, as far as modern masters go, and color and working with color, he is the best. If you ask anyone that's working right now or, or in the industry, they're gonna know who he is and what he does. I mean, the guy's work is incredible. And he is sort of an artist's artist. He is. Very, that's very a really good. So. That's very good term. We were talking about it in terms of that. Um, you know, if I ask any of my students in my class if they knew who Brian Selfridge is, they're they're not gonna know. He's not. You know, Jim Lee, he doesn't have that kind of name. But you ask people in the industry or people that even follow comics, and they know who Brian Selfridge is. And, again, that's why I was really really kind of uh, impressed with the approach that Marvel's taken with this book in terms of when you see his sketches. Normally, the formula is we attach a popular artist, attach a popular writer, start building a, a popular crew because their name is going to draw a fan base to it. And Brian Selfries, because of the way he approaches his craft, you can see in a lot of the conceptual sketches that one of the reasons he's on board is because not because he's just the guy that's going to be the penciler 
but they let him develop it, and they let him design a lot of the looks and a lot of the things that are going to you're going to see visually in it. And so he did a lot of character designs, tech designs, and uh, he gets to create. And uh, as everyone's mentioned, there's a little bit of Kirby tech in there. He's yep. redesigning the way his mask works, which I'm very curious because we, we haven't seen, I can't think of the name of the actor who's playing him in, the, in Captain America Civil War, but uh, we haven't seen him without the mask. So I'm right. curious how much of that was like Brian Stelfreeze and if there was any collaboration with the movie people because Marvel does tend to want to do that. But yeah. as you mentioned, uh, they're giving... Uh, Brian Stelfreeze a lot of cre uh, creative license to sort of design Wakanda and you were talking about the beads mm -hmm. um, yeah. which I uh, you just showed me earlier yeah. you, want, you want to talk a little bit about that uh, I think the the basic concept was that every Wakanda when they're born is giving uh, a bracelet with one it's called a life bead and that kind of is that it yeah, it's uh, they have a. As I understand it, they start off with one bead, and the beads are relevant to what the person's needs are. So as an infant, so the first one is healthcare. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So the first one's healthcare. So it's things that the infant's going to need, uh, ways that they can track what the infant needs, and then as you get older, they add more beads towards where your life path is, where you're choosing for it to go. So I think, and I don't know how much of this is purely stealth freeze and how much is like maybe Tommy Easy Coats, who, who knows, but yeah. uh, I guess the I, extrapolation would be sort of a cross between, you know, the paranoid idea of the government implanting you with chips and sort of cross with the idea of a smartphone, but mm -hmm. from birth, you know. Yeah. And so as you get older, you would have, I guess, and we haven't seen this yet because it's not in the pages. We've just seen the designs, but uh, I would guess like it would be like some sort of like apps and stuff like that help you like if you're yep. if you're in a certain like department or some type of science that you're interested in. Yeah, that's what I took away from it when I saw the concepts and they right, had right. little descriptions by the concepts. Was that yeah, it's kind of like their version of the of apps, and it's probably got you know holographics that they could use as well because they're really pushing it that uh, they're this really kind of high-tech um, technology, and they really have been pushing that. You know, uh, and what that tells you is that they're building, like, a world. They're building yeah. right. Wakanda as a culture, which, yep. you know, all too often in modern comics, when you're looking at Wakanda and Black Panther, they, they do have, like, certain cultural things that they'll bring up, but it is very much sort of limited and sort of viewed as just, like... Uh, it's just a random African kingdom that just happens to have this super science. Right? Yeah, and it's never really been developed. Uh, and I think that that's part of why this team is, I think, going to work well together. Because, like I was saying, that I can kind of see how they're collaborating on it. And that some of it might be Coates' ideas, that uh, Brian's making notes and, and coming up with the visuals for it. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, From that preview, it looks like they're going to deal with a lot of the... Uh, Aspects of ruling a kingdom, maybe having to make those difficult decisions that they might not praise you for, but it's the right decision and it has to be done. So they're going to deal with some more of that that mm -hmm. side of it than him just being a cool. Fighter. Yeah, there there was a bit of a almost, uh, and it was a six page preview, and it was almost a villainous, not that he was being painted as a villain, but sort of a villainous aspect to the monarchy, uh, but a necessary villain. You know, like not like he was not a dictator. But at some point, he has to make decisions that, as you said, the people aren't necessarily going to like, or some some people won't. Right. Um, and the concern, that, which I believe you you mentioned earlier, is that uh, this book looks really good. I'm actually so impressed by, and I probably wouldn't have been that interested if if, if I hadn't seen those preview pages. Um, but hopefully, like it it has a happy balance where you're not talking about politics because we're we're definitely saturated politics these days, although it feels like worldwide wrestling. The trick is you know? to, to make a statement without being too preachy and just stick it in someone's face. Right. right. Ideology as opposed to a soapbox. Yeah, you know? definitely. Um, because that's, you know, comics, even when we were kids in the 90s, had were able to ha like tap into social issues without saying, this person's right and this person's wrong. And so hopefully we get a little bit more of that, a little bit more of an old-fashioned story where you can say what you want to say without 
expecting your audience to follow along with you ideologically. Right. I think, ideologically. I think if he can tell the story similarly, to put a date on myself, the way uh, Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams handled Green Lantern and Green Arrow, and how Denny O'Neill was talking a lot of a lot of political and a lot of social uh, issues that were really hotbeds at that time, but it wasn't overly preachy. It was it was to build an awareness, but it was an awareness within their world. So it wasn't like he was saying you had to support this or not, but he was bringing viewers aware and it was making the characters realistic without making them not a hero a superhero anymore and that's where i think is that thing is that nobody wants to know that batman's got you know no cartilage in his knees anymore from all this stuff they want them to still be oh it's hero. cool he can just put a brace on him he's fully functional exactly and it's like nobody wants to know that they're that human they need to still stay the superhero but that realism that element of realism comes in when they are telling these kind of stories that are uh, not going to date the material, but talk about a social issue without it being too preachy. Right. So that's what I'm hoping for that they they match that Christ, that that kind of cross between a really good art and a really good story. Well, we know for sure we're going to get really good art. Yeah, and, definitely. And we didn't see too much of the scripting side on those six pages, but it was pretty solid. I mean, no idea what to expect from Tommy Hussey Coates as a as a writer. Unfortunately, I've never read his book, but. And I don't even uh, that one I believe is nonfiction anyway. Yeah. But yeah. seems pretty solid. He, he seems to have good ideas. So I'm, I'm really excited. To give it a for chance. It. Yeah. Definitely yeah. the book I'm looking forward to the most out of the next crop of uh, number ones. Do we know when that's coming out? Yes. <laughs> do we know or, or, or Dude, does is someone something know? that you want to show? You when, or, hey Jason. Yeah. Can you give me a release date on Black Panther? This is real life, yeah. folks. <laughs> April 6th. So that comes out on April 6th, which we knew. <laughs> we we totally didn't have to freeze and ask across the room. But so anyway, <laughs> so check out Black Panther. Uh, if you're Things walking around your local it. comic shop, go go look through the back issue bin, see if you can find some Paul Ryan stuff. Uh, if you're a New Orleans local, come see Fletch Boogie, and he'll be happy to help you find a comic, including... Matilda, Forces of Evil versus the Third Grade. And uh, they'll hook you up. All right. So I've been Adam. Fletch. Dead Wally. Read more comics. Read more comics. There you go.